Welcome Eve, welcome Pippa, great to see you both. So this is a sort of cameras on evening because Eve was asking before, it's fine to keep your microphones on and we're going to have quite an informal sort of chatty evening celebrating the exhibition. Um, but I'm not going to kick off formally because it's only just seven o'clock. And just looking at who else is here, if you can't see everybody, we've got the whole team from together. We've got Alison, our club's program leader. We've got Kate, our youth development worker. We've got Renee Wallen, our social media lead. We've got Julie Newman, our chair. I'll slow down a bit. We've got Chris Burrow who's our absolute favourite sign language interpreter. So we're very pleased that Chris could be here this evening. And we've got Julia from Global Real-Time Captioning doing the captions. And I think it's probably true to say that Julia is also our favourite captioner. So it's going to be a lovely, friendly hour celebrating what I cannot believe is our 12th open exhibition. And I think I'll start while we're waiting for other people to come in by just reflecting on that a little bit. I can't even remember how the open exhibition started. I can just remember being back in the summer of 2012, about a week before the Paralympics started in, I think it's fair to say a strange little space that was the Advice Arcade in the middle of Stratford. And Sarah Hughes, who became one of our founding directors and is, you know, is exhibiting tonight. I hope Sarah's going to be able to join us. But Sarah was helping me curate this show. I'm still not quite sure how we even managed to get the message out about it. And we hung it in what was, I think effectively they called it the Stratford People's History Museum. Now, if anybody's aware of the disability protest exhibition at the Manchester People's History Museum, you'll know that's a very big space. But the Newham People's History Museum was a teeny tiny space, which was usually owned by the Labour Party. Well, I think it was owned by the Labour Party. It was usually the Labour Party headquarters. And they'd rented it out at vast expense to Eastside Community Heritage, which is a local heritage organisation. And Eastside Community Heritage decided that it was essential that there was something about Newham during the Olympics and Paralympics. Oh, Hello, Glory. Welcome, Glory. Welcome, Angus. Welcome, David. I'm just talking a little bit about the very first open exhibition while we're welcoming people in. Um, I would just pop yourself on mute if you're not speaking, just in terms of background noise might make it a little bit easier. So, yeah, brilliant. Thank you, Glory. So, yes, the very first open exhibition back in 2012 was at the Newham People's History Museum, normally known as the Stratford Labour Party headquarters, and it was run by Eastside Community Heritage. And it consisted of two rooms. And in one room, they'd managed to get an entire exhibition around about the history of Newham. And in this tiny little back room, they offered it to us for the Paralympics as an exhibition space. And we just covered the walls from floor to ceiling. And the there were no windows, but it was still wonderful. And Stephen Timms MP, who's been a great supporter of ours ever since, came and all of the exhibiting artists were presented with Paralympic medals by Stephen Timms. And generally it was a wonderful occasion. He, that was not the first exhibition, which of course was due to be a one-off. And here we are on our 12th open exhibition celebrating the new Disability Pride Month. Um, just going to wait for Jemima to, oh, I think Jemima's joining, but um, I'm not sure if the waiting room process is being a bit slow tonight. If you could keep an eye on that, Emily, in case anybody needs any help getting in. So that was our open exhibition. 
And when we carried on with Together 2012, of course, we wanted to carry on having an open exhibition. And our open exhibition is very different to most people's open exhibitions because most open exhibitions charge you a fee to enter. And then it's a bit grace and favour whether you're judged worthy of having your work shown. Greetings, Jemima. We're just talking a little bit while people are joining us about the very first Together 2012 open exhibition in 2012. So one of the things that's always made our open exhibition different is we say to artists, we guarantee to show your work so long as it's family friendly, because that's always been a kind of a criteria for the venues that we've used. You know, we haven't had access to gallery spaces because there aren't any in Newham. So we've had to sort of go with community centre rules. But it's also been about saying to the artist, you have to choose which work you you put in. It's not going to be down to us. And I don't know, Alison, bringing it completely up to date, whether I could just get you spotlit as well and just have a quick chat about what that's how that's worked out with the art club this year and how useful it's been for people to sort of really start thinking about how to select their own work yeah i just think that's a really important element um and they can start thinking about their work in relation to each other um each piece and just picking what they feel is the strongest I think particularly as disabled people, we're often, and but all, all artists, we're kind of put, asked to put our work up for other people's judgment. And actually, I'm very firmly of the opinion that the only person's judgment that really matters is our own. And, you know, it's not very good to sort of make yourself vulnerable and have other people kind of just churn in going, oh, no, 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 no. But at the same point, we have to know what what we prefer, you know, why why do we think this is our strongest why do we think it's most suitable i mean how did you manage because I'm, I'm sure i haven't learned that yet how did you manage to support people to be able to make judgments about their work well i think they're all quite independent and you know i didn't really have to do anything they just chose what <laughs> they wanted and sent it to me and i think that's what makes the open exhibition different because it's not in front of judges and juries, you know, it's um, sort of their own making, really, right to the selection. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that I've been doing recently with a freelance hat on is working with Shape Arts, who are developing a whole kind of, I don't know whether to call it an exhibit or a gallery, but are basically taking a disability arts installation to Venice next year, which has never been done before. So they've commissioned some artists to be critical friends. And you know me, I can be critical of anybody and particularly shape, but I had a fascinating discussion with the curator about the whole concept of the Together Open as opposed to this traditional idea that other people choose your work. And it's one of the things that we're now looking at for Venice is if they select the artists, getting the artist to select their own work, which again has never been done. Mm. But to me, it just makes so much sense because actually many of us don't know. Hey, we need it tomorrow. We need it tomorrow. Hello, guys. Hello, Dwayne. It's great to see you. I'm just going to ask you to pop yourself on mute. Oh, I've popped you on mute for. Yeah, so we're just going to try and keep the background noise to a minimum, but I'm going to come and up. I'm going to invite people to talk about their work when we get to their work. So it's almost 10 past seven. We've just been talking a little bit about the history of the exhibition. This is the 12th open exhibition we began in together in 2012. And we've just been talking for anybody who's just joined us about what makes our open exhibition different. And the key thing that makes it different is we guarantee to include your work as long as it's family friendly. But we also ask you to be the judge of your own work and for you to decide which is the strongest piece rather than handing that decision making over to other people. But what I'd like to do now is share my screen and start having a look at the exhibition. And 
if you'd like to artists who are present i would love to hear more about your work Yes, so one of the things that's unusual about this year's exhibition is it's taking place in July. And that's almost going back to our roots in 2012 of this being a summer exhibition. After 2012, it became part of our Disability History Month Festival. So the open exhibition has usually taken place in November. And I think it's great to have it back in the summer but I also think it's great that we've got a Disability Pride Month, which is something we've waited for for a very long time. I love Disability History Month, don't get me wrong, but it is a, a the sort of coldest, most miserable, least accessible time of the year. And now, of course, that's also when COVID is raging as well. So I think it's fantastic that July is Disability Pride Month. And this is very much kind of taking... It also means the open exhibition is as with Disability History Month, taking place as part of something much bigger. But it was like LGBTQI plus Pride Month started in America. So it, if you've not heard of it before, it's because it's only been going for a little bit. And the criteria for the open is if you've got any kind of connection with Newham or any kind of connection with Together 2012, then you're very welcome and in, indeed encouraged to send us one family friendly piece for guaranteed inclusion. So we have over 30 exhibiting artists, including a group piece from Mighty Mega Club. And we'll come on and talk about that a bit later. But I just want to flag up right from the start that we've got a number of art groups as well as individuals who've contributed to the exhibition and therefore to the curating. So we have the Art for Fun group, the Children's Discovery Centre, Enough, Rosetta Arts Centre, and of course, the Together Art Club. And Alison Marchant, international artist in her own right, but also our club's programme leader, has really done the vast majority of the curating because she's also been liaising with most of these other groups as well. Kate, a youth development worker, again, has been liaising with Discover Centre and with young artists. So we have it as a sort of team credit this year, but it's very much the rest of the team, not me. I've just put it together on the night, as it were. And the first piece that we have in the exhibition is by Tracy Vidal, and it's called Re-Remembering Re -remembering pre lockdown Hub Hugs and Hand Pump Greetings. Um, Alison, you know Tracy's work really well, and we had a solo exhibition of Tracy's work in our last festival, and you said some very interesting things because I remember you've You've known Tracy for some time since she was a student. I just wondered, as Tracy isn't here, whether there's anything you could just tell us about the work and possibly just give us a quick description. Yeah. Um, can you hear me? We can. Oh, good, because I wasn't sure if I'd left myself on mute. But, yeah, what's really characteristic of Tracy's work is she tends to flatten the whole image with the paintwork and she uses repetition. So you've got the wallpaper in the background and the petals echo the shape of the hair. And they're also seen again in the ice cream um, behind. Um, and yeah, and I just like that mirroring of the two women that are almost um, doing the hand pump greetings. Um, next to each other so she's, she often uses mirroring in, in her work and she reduces everything to a flat kind of design so mm. that's really helpful mm. and interesting thank you Alison and the next piece I'm going to look at is by Emily Welsh who is also my assistant and has been doing sterling work at all of our events since she started really. Emily, do you want to just tell us a little bit about this piece? 
Hi. Yeah. Um, this was shot in 2021 um, in a sort of dirty, more or less abandoned car park um, at night. <laughs> um, I shoot on film. Um, so, yeah, I mean, there's not really much to tell. It's just uh, me and my friend went out. Um, I don't really do sort of booked or paid shoots my own sort of personal photography I like to sort of collaborate with people um friends and other sort of artists and we just sort of went out with no sort of real set idea in mind um did a bit of experimenting and sort of came out with this mystical looking portal image but really it was just sort of a grimy car park in Harlow <laughs> so <laughs> that's it really I think that's really inspiring, Emily. Do you want to just describe it briefly for anybody who can't see it properly? Yeah, so it's a side profile of a man um, sort of backlit by a sort of orangey yellow lit circle um, and it's sort of lighting up his the profile of his face. He's sort of looking out dramatically, um, almost sci-fi-ish, I would kind of describe the image. Um, yeah, and it's quite minimalistic as well. It's um, sort of two or three colours, really. Black, brown, yellow, orange. Um, yeah. Thank you. I think one of the things I really take from that is that number one, lighting is really important in photography, but number two, you don't have to go out there with loads of expensive lights. It's about looking for the light that's actually there. And I love what you were saying about sort of experimenting, not going out with a set idea and then just being really open to what the creative possibilities are. And like you say, you know, shooting on film, it doesn't, what I find in my, my own work is it doesn't matter if the image isn't a high, resolution you know if it's a strong image it's a strong image and you can always manipulate it afterwards to do things with it so thank you for that Emily I think it's a great piece and I think very inspiring you know I, I just really love the way it's lit thank you so this next piece is by Whisper and it's called Peace Talks and it's it's a 2023 piece that's responding to the G7 talks in Hiroshima. So what you see in the foreground is lots of animals having, well, no, sorry, get my words right, insects having peace talks. And you have Hiroshima in the background. But it, so it's very, very much an allegory, which is something we've been talking about in our carnival projects. <laughs> Whisper does very big pieces. So this is one and a half meters by one and a half meters. And it's so it's it's very different, but it also reminds me that our last in venue exhibition in 2019 had a very large piece by Whisper, and our very last in-person celebration of exhibitions we're all photographed in front of that piece so that's quite a reminder to me now this next one i believe alison comes from the art for fun group is that yeah right? it does i think it's wonderful i don't know if any of my colleagues feel like giving an audio description sure so in the background, there's sort of, they almost look like leaf shapes in orange, burgundy red, brown, um, olive green, and a more sort of forest green. And then in the foreground or in the centre of all these leaf shapes, there's a man who has quite a big body in dark blue and like a brown collar. And he seems to have a beard and maybe be balding. Um, yeah, I mean, to me, this is my age as well, there's something very powerful about it. And I think, mm -hmm. you know, although the body shape is perhaps because the body shape isn't at all naturalistic, 
but it reminds me of Lenin. It's, it's a sort of, to me, it's, it's, it could almost be a conceptual piece about the Soviet Union, and I know it isn't, but I think that's, again, one of the wonderful things about the open exhibition. We just show the work. We don't say this person's a student, this person has learning difficulties, this person's an amateur, this person's a professional. All of the work is there together and it makes its own relationships and it has it, yeah, it finds its own way. And I find that, yeah, I, I absolutely love this piece. It doesn't even have a title, but um, well done, Sharifa. It's amazing, sorry, Gu. I was going to say, it's amazing that it's in felt pen because it, it looks really painterly. Mm. Absolutely. And again, I think particularly particularly now that we are not able to run in venue sessions where we can provide materials, it also reminds me, whenever I see the open exhibition, that people, you don't need expensive equipment. You know, it's wonderful to have it and it's wonderful to do things with expensive paints, but actually that's not what art's all about. It reminds me, Ju, of um, Pavarotti, the very, very large-bodied, very powerful singer, um, Italian man, and it's all the little dots in the background make me think of people. So it, I find it interesting that we it, it impacts on each of us differently according to our life experiences. It reminds me of Orson Welles in those cherry adverts. Really imposing. That's absolutely right, Angus. Thank you for that. And um, so this next print is a lino print. So it's just red on white and it's Leo. So it's the a lion's, well, you can see the lion's head and its front legs and the first half of its body. I think it's very powerful in its own way. It's the kind of image that you could easily buy as a card or as a print to put on the wall. Is it another art for fun image, Alison? Yeah, I mean, I really like the background as well, the sort of unevenness of it, because that would have been, the ink would have been rolled onto the lino, so you've got the impressions of the, the roller. Um, and it's just so simple, really, just a few lines um, making that lion. And it's, it has a presence, doesn't it? It does. It reminds me when we were still at Vicarage Lane, we managed to inherit, well, I say inherit, we found a load of unused lino cutting kit and started working with it. And I'd never come across it before, but I... I think we will probably start looking at ways that we can do, I mean, I know you've done all sorts of non-traditional printing technique already on the Tuesday Art Club sessions, haven't you, Alison? Yeah, mono printing. So I think it would be interesting to sort of carry on with that. For anybody who, I mean, I think everybody here probably does know about our Art Club provision, but I think it's worth saying again, we've carried over what, now seems of course a very long time ago our original art club sessions so on a tuesday we have always done craft-based work but we look at techniques that you can also use in fine art and that's always been very important to us that it's it fully inclusive accessible techniques that you can enjoy for their own sake but you can also use in fine art and then on a friday where people used to come in and we would provide a big choice of materials and surfaces so that people could find their own way. We're, we still aim to do that, but we have a still life session. And the idea of the still life session is you can really, you can do it with a piece of scrap paper and a pencil or a biro. You can use expensive paints. You can do things in between. You can use felt tips, but it's a real opportunity to just focus on developing your own voice, developing your own artistic technique in a very supportive atmosphere. You know, there's not a lot of feedback. It's quite mindful. You know, Tuesday is really designed as a more chatty group. But, um, but I've been so impressed at the range of things that Alison finds to do. You know, I just wish I wasn't stuck doing the email and the boring admin stuff and could actually still come to the clubs. But I thoroughly recommend if anybody hasn't tried the Tuesday group that they give it a go. Now, this 
next image. So we're now getting on to sort of what's more of a portrait section, although my definitions are very loose. And this is by Rene, who's our social media lead. And I wondered, Rene, whether you'd like to tell us a little bit more about this one. Yes, thank you, Joe. Can you hear me OK? Yes, perfect. So this is my painting of Daniel Craig, and I copied it from a picture in a magazine. It, I did it during an art lesson in an art club that I used to go to in person. And the teacher had prepared all the backgrounds. So the background here is like purpley, different shades of mauve and white stripes. And then she'd put this very thick paste all over the paper to make it textured. So I then painted Daniel Craig, the actor, on top of that. And I did it all in black, white and grey. And it's in acrylic paint. And one of the things I love about acrylic paint is that it varies depending how much water you mix with it. So it can act like watercolour and be very soft and gentle and well blended. But what I prefer is to use no water at all. So it's just very, very thick and splodged on. So I did that for this painting, um, just using a mix of black and white. And I was very pleased how it came out, although it's a little bit wonky. Um, and I wasn't sure it looked like him, but my son immediately recognised him, which really made me pleased. And it's the best painting I've done this year. So that's why I put it into the exhibition. Um, and I hope that you like it. So thank you for including it. Well, I certainly like it. And I very much liked the one that you, the portrait that you put in for last November's exhibition as well. So I look forward to seeing many more of your portraits, Rene. Thank you. Yeah, wonky is good. <laughs> Thank you. Always. Oh, I think lovely, also, Rene. Lovely. Yeah, Thank you very that, much, Tom. That sense of different, you know, if you look at surrealism or Picasso, when people sort of, well, you might look, do the cheekbone from one perspective and then you might do the eyebrow from a different perspective. So perhaps there was some of that as well. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So next in our portrait session is a portrait in mostly black, white and greys of a long haired white cat. Now, is this another one from Art for Fun or is this from Rosetta? I think it's from Rosetta, that one. Well, that's brilliant timing because I'm going to pronounce your name wrong. I'm so sorry. Fi or Fee has just joined us hey. from Rosetta. Um, if we can pop a spotlight on Emily. Brilliant, welcome. So this is an opportunity for us to hear just a little bit from Rosetta about what they offer, because I think not everybody is aware that Rosetta Arts offer artists based in Newham. There's quite a lot of in-venue provision in terms of courses. There's also the op opportunity to take part occasionally in professional development and exhibitions. So we've been, I think we've been very, We've had a close relationship with Rosetta from the start and it's only got closer over the years. So it's been great to see some of the Rosetta artists entering the open exhibitions in the last few years. So over to you, Fee. Hi everyone. So uh, my name is Fee. I'm a project coordinator at Rosetta Arts. Um, so I'll give you a brief right now what Rosetta Arts is. We're an arts organisation based in West Ham and um, what we want, we aim to do is make art more accessible for everyone. We, we just want to get people involved and help people um, help personal development, but also well-being. So Rosetta Arts offers a wide range of stuff for adult learning, but also uh, kids as well. So um, for our adults, we have adult visual art courses such as pottery, drawing and painting, um, life drawing, photography, um, and mosaics. We also offer SEND uh, workshops as well, which are uh, varying term to term, but it's, um, some of them is like uh, arts and crafts or mosaics. Uh, but other than our course, we actually offer a lot more than that. So we have programs which run termly. Um, we have one of our big ones is called Art Accelerator, 
So Art Accelerator is for personal development and growth of local artists in East London. And we basically give you guys a studio space, a bursary, and we give you guys workshops on how to uh, grow yourself as an artist and make a sustainable like, business out of it. Um, yeah, and it's all based locally to uh, West Ham Station and Newark, or in the heart of Newark. And can I just pick up on something you said a little bit ago, which is about well-being. You're also developing an arts and well-being centre in Green Street, aren't you? Um, unfortunately, we've uh, lost that space, but we are looking to open up a new one soon to kind of do what that space was looking to do. But we are still offering a bunch of courses around um, Newham, and it's actually our 30th anniversary as an organisation. So in September or leading up to September and August as well, we'll be running a bunch of workshops um, for adults, kids, and uh, yeah, just want to get everyone involved. Yeah, so I mean, I have to say that under our insurance, I cannot promote in venue opportunities, but should you be oh. taking part in in venue opportunities, then I would definitely recommend looking at the 30th anniversary celebrations i mean i think i'm so disappointed but i have to say not surprised to hear about the arts and well-being center falling through one of the reasons that together 2012 now operates entirely online is that there's even fewer spaces available than there were in 2012 and in 2012 when we started up one of the reasons we kept going after 2012 was we had the lowest level of cultural engagement in the uk and the fewest venues. And since then, almost all of the community venues that we used to operate in have been closed and Stratford Circus has been closed. And the light on the horizon was the Rosetta Arts Arts and Wellbeing Centre. All I can say without being political is if the political will was there, we would have the venues that we would deserve and that would include an accessible publicly funded art gallery space. Fortunately, we're able to go all around the world online, but please let us know, Fee, what we can continue to do to make sure that you get a new physical space for arts and well-being. Because I know that I've been, yeah, I've been very optimistic that that was going to be somewhere that members of our art club who are based in Newham could go. So I'm very sorry to hear that. Could I just if you happen to know anything about it do you know this artist and is there anything you can tell us about this work we're just going through talking about the individual pieces in the show um unfortunately i don't know this artist um i'm not sure if that was submitted through us to be honest yeah um, we we think it was but no no that's fine because what we've had in terms of rosetta contributions to the exhibition in the past is we've had young people through the art stars which is one of the saturday groups that rosetta runs and we've also had adults who take part in the courses and we've had adults who are taking part in professional development so we've really had representation over the last few years from people who work at every level in rosetta and i just hope that we get more and more in the future but also that Rosetta are able to expand because I think it's true to say that at the moment there's quite limited physical access to the spaces that Rosetta is limited to using and Rosetta tries very very hard to make everything accessible but we do need the promises that were made to us before 2012 and the promises indeed that the Arts Council has been making recently about new venues and the promises the council have been making about new venues actually to come to fruition but thank you for that fee so if we carry on now so i think if you just take fee spotlight off emily and fee um, i'll just have to head off but thank you guys yeah, thank you so uh, much for joining us fee. we really appreciate um, it and good if you luck like more the... info yeah if you like more information our newsletters are available online um via our website and you can find out all about the art workshops and programs we have running um yeah hope to see you there yeah i really recommend signing up if you're based in newham then i really recommend signing up to rosetta's weekly newsletter so right. in
Yeah, I really like the composition, actually, of this picture and the way the background is all flat shapes and the cat is just like a bundle of texture. <laughs> it's a very, very striking piece, isn't it? Mm. And, um, and next we move on to a pen and ink drawing from Ella Higginbottom. And Ella, if Ella wasn't exhibiting in our very first exhibition, she's certainly exhibited in most of our exhibitions. So I've been very pleased to see this from Ella. I think it's a very interesting drawing. I won't read the, some of the writing on it, but it it's entitled Someone is Always Watching. And I think as a sort of expert exploration of sense of paranoia but also somebody really is watching I think it's a very very interesting piece but I'm going to gallop on because the next one is by our very own Alison Marchant so Alison over to you yeah so this was a photograph that I found in the archives at Rochdale Art Gallery in Lancashire in 1989 and it's a small picture originally, and it shows um, a disused cotton mill where the floor is covered with dust. Um, and at the time I was interviewing um, ex-cotton workers, um, and they talked about this breathing condition called bisonosis, which was caused by the cotton dust in the factories. And I just thought uh, that was one installation that I did with audio work. But then when I found this photograph, it became another piece. So I just enlarged it to 10 foot by eight foot. And it's in three strips that butt against each other like wallpaper. And um, I was contacted by a researcher last year who was putting together a show called Radical Art in the 80s at Rochdale Art Gallery. And she contacted me. So the piece was installed again after all those years. And it's called System Sustained Silence, which was a, is actually a comment on the loss of the cotton industry, but also the fact that the women um, couldn't hardly breathe. Um, and they also, didn't get much union help either. So it was a story that was lost really. And the piece actually reclaims that. It's incredibly evocative. I mean, I would love to see it huge, but I think one of the things that I've really realized over the last few years is how elitist physical gallery spaces are. I mean, as a wheelchair user with very limited energy, I've always found them very difficult to access, mm -hmm. but I don't think it had really dawned on me just how much of it's also a geographical privilege. It's an income related privilege. You know, In Newham, you've always got to be able to travel outside the borough to get to the gallery. So I think I'm, you know, I'm interested in looking at things like how do you how do you project your computer screen or your phone to make it bigger? You know, how do we manage to have some of these experiences in our own home? But in the meantime, if you click on any of these pictures, you oh, right. Oh, right. Yeah. I do say this at the beginning of the web page, but it, you do have that facility to look at pictures a bit more close up and indeed kind of zoom in a bit more. So this next piece is by Pippa Marshall. And I'm wondering, Pippa, whether you would be kind enough to introduce your piece. Thank you, yeah. Um, so um, this um, is a couple of Sumi Nagashi prints, which is floating ink. Um, and um, I first um, learned how to do this at a Dash um, workshop a couple of years ago. Um, and kind of the, the marbling um, that Alison did more recently kind of reignited my interest in it. And I think one of the things that really appeals to me about it is that actually I can influence how it goes, but I can't actually predict how it's how the result's going to come out. And I think that challenges my perfectionism. And I also um, just like the, the flow of the water and the, the naturalness of it. Um, 
and the kind of minimalism of the the black and the white and I was a little bit nervous um submitting this but I'm really happy with the way it's turned out with the way the exhibition's being curated I think it um it's it's wonderful how everything sits together so thank you Mm. I think it's a wonderful piece. I think one of the things that I find very interesting about this, which of course is part of the joys of digital, is that they're actually quite small prints, but they look like they could be huge. And of course, digitally, they could be huge, whether that's mm. printed or projected. I was really struck when I first saw Frida Kahlo's work within the tape about how much smaller the pictures were than the posters you know because you always assume that everything is going to be huge and then again as a wheelchair user you think well of course she couldn't possibly have done it if it was 20 feet high but it's that sense of when something's reproduced not really knowing what size it should be but I just think these would work beautifully huge and you know and I can see that they're beautiful mm -hmm. in miniature I love the choice of Thank the you. rice paper. Was that something you had to buy specially or was it recommended or did you have a supply? Or... It was something that was that was recommended and was supplied as, as part of the um, original course that I did with Dash. It's not something that I probably would have thought of buying before because I didn't know um, about um, the rice paper. It's quite a, a thin um, paper and it is it's quite nerve-wracking for somebody like me putting really thin paper on top of water but it actually does create very clear um, prints and obviously it's um, I think it's a traditional material for for the Japanese printing as well so um, and the one on the left it looks 3D it, it almost looks like bark you know that's peeling yeah. away mm. yeah. Like yes, I can see that. It was like Pippa was saying about the movement. It's wonderful. So thank you very much for that, Pippa. I find it very, it's one of those things where sort of note to self, I must at some point in the future, not too distant, find a way of trying this out for myself. And I, I hope that lots of people see the show and are inspired by different things. So now for something completely different, which I think is actually one of Alison's still lives. And yeah. Eve, I think Eve's with us tonight. Yeah, I'm I'm here. Would you like me to talk about my picture? Yes, do you want to um describe it first? Yeah, sure. So I used they're basically two different types of shoes i think they're adults and kids shoes and um i guess i get to use pencil for mine because i wanted to show the detail of the shoes and i guess i get to like draw below and above the shoe to like show the clearness of the shoe if that makes sense it mm. does and i think it's a really good example of a still life and the reason i say that is it's got a to me a still life tells a story yeah and that sort of you know, you don't know what the story is exactly, but you think, well, there's two people and they're, like you say, probably one's an adult and one's a child, but possibly not. And they've taken their shoes off. Have they taken their shoes off because it's the house rule? Have they taken their shoes off to do something else? Have they taken their shoes off to go to bed? So it starts me thinking, what's the story? But there's, it's very, very much has a story. And I really... Yeah, and I did, I did do a colleague version but I thought this one was a lot better than the colleague one because you can see it more clearly yeah and I think that's interesting and I think again it's really good to be able to make those judgments about your own yeah, work. yeah I, I really like the background Eve because you've handled the background really well and it just so, yeah, and I did try and do like different shades as well. Of, yeah, it's like, got a lot of a lot of energy in it. Yeah, thanks. It has, and there's a lot of energy in the pieces that are coming up. So, 
We've got Lee Brooker run. I, I don't think Lee's with us here tonight, but Lee always does beautiful representational work. But we do have Dwayne Bryan with us, and this is Dwayne's piece. If we're a oh, brilliant! There you are, Dwayne. I really liked when I was when I was ordering this because the curating is a sort of broader job. I really liked having two sets of shoes and then run, then followed by something really energetic. I mean, this is a we don't expect the open exhibition to be a brand new piece. So this is 2021. But I do you remember making this, Dwayne? You know, what what was motivating you? Oh, you're on mute. Um well I did it at an art session at Enough. And um, it was more sort of being in the wild or being in a jungle or being somewhere where it's sort of wild and you're sort of running through that. So you're sort of in the middle of it. Um, I think it's excitement. I think it's panic. And I think it's a bit, bit sort of slight mayhem. Yeah, I get all of that. And I think it's because you've got the beautiful coloured drawing with the felt letters and that, I don't know whether this square, I suspect it's shiny paper originally. It all takes on a different texture when it's digitised, which I think is really interesting as well because everything becomes part of the same surface. But yeah, I have, when I looked at that, I had that real sense of urgency, Dwayne. And like I said, I saw the shoes and then I thought, and that to me is like you say, it's that sort of panic, run, 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 run. Not that I can run, but you know, I can turn up my power and go very, very fast. And I just think it's got so much energy and it's, but it's all about kind of getting away from where it is, which I think is really interesting. The idea that this very natural, well, fairly naturalistic kind of jungly scene holds this kind of hidden, invisible threat. So, yeah. I love me. It's an advert for Extinction Rebellion. <laughs> Thank you, Angus. I think that's absolutely <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that too. <laughs> and um, and now we get on to, I think, again, this is from the Art for Fun group. Yeah, that's right. And this is a sort of series of different coloured, I hesitate to say squiggles because I don't think that's fair to the piece. It's got lots and lots and lots of energy, but it also, to me, kind of almost encapsulates that sort of frantic, mad running around I don't know whether anybody else thinks the same. I really like the simplicity of it. I mean, and just also like the colours, like the, the black goes back, the orange and pink comes forward. Um, and it, it does look quite 3D, actually, like it could be a wire sculpture or something like that. It does, and it's another one that's actually quite a small piece, but looks like it could be huge. And of course, you could print it, and it could yes. be huge. And I think it if would... it was ten feet high, it would look great. It would, and like I say, that is the the plus side of having mm. a digital exhibition. And here we have another marker pen work. This is David Elton. And David's been, like so many of you, David's been exhibiting with us over the years. So it's great to see David's work. And this is marker pen on cloth. And you can see, particularly if I zoom in, that using cloth just makes it sort of spread out a little bit. And I think it's so interesting that it gives it that sort of different effect. Mm. Yeah, it sort of bleeds into the cotton. I think That's it's the cotton. Right word. Yes, and I think again, if we look, if we look at the surfaces we can recycle, that sense of things just sort of bleeding and blurring is really interesting. Now, I think we have Dawn here. Yeah, we do. Dawn, would you like to talk about your work? Um. Whoa, Jude. I um. I've really enjoyed um uh, doing the work. Um, I done it. Uh, I done it in felt, 
pots and um, also colouring pens. And um, and I, you know, and I'd like doing all the shapes and um, the designs and that. And um, you know, I really, really like doing it. I thought it was really, you know, I enjoyed it. I really like it, and I've I've seen you develop the. You know, I think everybody's got their own style. And some some people's more obvious than others, but I've seen you develop this style over the years and it just gets better and better. And I just wanted to say that, Dawn, you know, I'd known I would know it was your work anywhere. Yeah, but Dawn, I, thank you. But I also think it it keeps improving. You yeah, know. Dawn's got a series of these. There's over a hundred. Um, and you did quite a lot of them through lockdown, didn't you, Dawn? I did, Alison. Yes, I do. I've got a, a good few of them, well, a, quite a lot that I've done. Yes, and, I, I think, and you're certainly not the only one, but I think in the coming year when we've got more team members, then what we need to do is take those away and get them scanned for you, Dawn, because I think they work beautifully digitally. And I oh, think they're scanned you. and photographed. You'll be very impressed. But yeah, I... There's things that I really like the lines just here, for example, it's very different and it just gives, it just gives the rest of it a completely different texture. But anyway, well done Dawn. Thank um, you Jude, thank we've you. We've got 10 minutes and there's a couple more people I'd like to get through. So I'm gonna skip through some of this, but um, this is one of Duncan Bridgestock's collages. Duncan did a wonderful exhibition with us in 2021 that is still online. And he's just developed this amazing collage style using domestic recycling. Um, somebody else, I don't think Ellen's here tonight. No. Ellen again has been working with Alison over several years developing this technique where she draws round things, then she colours them in, then she cuts those shapes out and sticks onto something else. And it's not a collage technique that most people use. And she did a whole series of kitchen implements, which I thought was really interesting. What I like about this is that they're, they're not a pair of hands, they're two separate hands. And that's not immediately obvious, but as there's two thumbs in the same place, you know, yeah, they're two left hands. They're not a left hand and a right hand. So it, it's actually a portrait of a couple. It reminds me of the um, the cave paintings where people would blow around their hands. Mm. They blow yeah. yes. around the hands. And we've got, and of course, we've got the hands project, but. I'll come on to that another time. So this was my collage, which was very much actually inspired by Duncan's collage, but it was really knocked up very quickly using quick collage techniques because we needed to find an image to advertise our workshop for Newham Heritage Month. But in a sort of very, very abstract way, this is E16 with the Royal Docks and the Thames and the A13 and Canning Town, where the little heart is. That's lovely, Jude. Well, I wouldn't go that far, Dawn. Oh, oh it's, I love that. It's really it's nice. Amazing love. what you can do with a bit of cardboard and some scraps, and I would recommend that to anybody. Now, this, I think, is, again, I'm going to scroll through because to get to some other people, but there's something almost Japanese, I think, about Sam's crayons piece. I think it's partly the subject matter and partly the colours. And then we have this beautiful piece from Jane Walters, who's one of our young artists who has only been able to participate with us since we moved online. You may have remember Jane's image was used for one of our past exhibitions, but she's just amazing. And I believe, Kate, she'd just come out of hospital when she was produced this. Yeah, it was incredible that she was able to make it. Um, and she also makes um paintings on bags and t-shirts and all sorts of clothing as well wow and, um the sea so it's in mixed media acrylics inks glues and glitters so using loads of different techniques there and it's got corals all overlapping and wave shapes and kind of shell shapes and you can't tell quite what's what but it's it's stunning yeah Lovely. 
we're very proud to have young people with us and including mm. young people like Eve who've been with us since she was indeed probably about 10 or 11 in the first exhibition so it's been great to see Eve growing up and taking part and now contributing so this is Tony Maloney who's one of our directors and that's blue tits through my window and that's watercolor on paper now here we have a beautiful piece from Jemima Hughes Jemima's with us tonight I don't know whether Jemima wants to say anything but it's a needle felt picture view from the back door Jemima said when she submitted it that it was a technique where she was using hand over hand support I just wanted to say harking back to the late great Catherine Aranello who was a very close friend of mine we had some very long conversations about people who use assistance in our work. And what we looked at was the young British artists, they're all older than us now, of course. And do they make their own work? No. They send, they get computer scans, they send all, you know, their statues are made by craftspeople in Italy using wonderful marble. I saw a piece at the Turner Prize exhibition, the craftsmanship was exquisite. And then I discovered that 12 different craftspeople had been commissioned to make up the different elements. So Catherine and I both agreed, if you're a disabled person using an assistant, there's really no difference. Mm -hmm. Being a non-disabled person using an assistant, it's still your, you know, you're the author of that work. I think, you know, sometimes I've collaborated with assistants and then of course I, I name them as the collaborator, but I've named, but I've collaborated with them. It's not because of the assistance. And I think as disabled people, you know, whether it's somebody helping us to exhibit or helping us to produce the piece, we need to remember it's absolutely fine. You know, if everybody else who doesn't even need assistance still has it, you know, there's no reason why we should think our work is less worthy of our name because we've used assistance. Did you want to say anything about it, Jemima? Yeah, Jemima has something prepared on her ASC. This is a needle-felt picture of the view from the back of my house. You can see trees at the sides and our garden with pumpkins in the vegetable garden and little fruit trees with apples. There are sheep in the field next door, and a view of the valley in Kend Downs, with fluffy white clouds. We have lots of clouds like that here. I do needle felting with my PMAIC. She supports my hand to hold the needle and push it, and helps me pull out all the wool. I like how that feels. I design the picture and choose all the colours but I need hand over hand support. I made this for my dad last Christmas. It was difficult to decide what to submit. I do painting and collage hand over hand too, but I worked on this one for a really long time. Thank you, Jemima, I'm sure you did. It's absolutely wonderful. And um, I think we'd all love a view like that from the back door so it our time is almost up i'm going to skid through and just show you the rest of the exhibition so we have some ceramics this is from rosetta arts so and it's worth bearing in mind if you're based in newham that rosetta arts have the only kiln in newham and they will allow you to put stuff in if you ask well if i ask them they'll do it as a favor so if anybody's got anything that they need firing let me know this, I think, is this Art for Fun or Art for Fun or is it Rosetta Alison? It's Art for Fun. Yeah, so this is air dried clay, so which kind of proves my point, you know, 
only Rosetta have a kiln, but we've got some lovely air dried clay. This is Julie Newman, our chair's digital piece, but because we've only got a minute left, I'm not going to ask Julie to talk about that. That's an older piece. We've got some more photography in here. This is from Julie Cordell. This is a wonderful collage from Blake Jarrett Gibbons. And Blake has been volunteering with us since 2012. So he and Dawn are our longest serving volunteers. This is Crystal Pease's recycled plastic flowers, which I believe she did in one of the art club sessions. And this is a joint piece by Mighty Mega Club called Turtles and Fish. And the Mighty Mega Club meets on a Saturday. Their families from all over London, and we've been working with Mighty Mega Club for a long time. I always love their work, you know, and it's so tactile. And um, yes, I would go and see more of it, but it's eight o'clock. So I'm just going to ask Kate Rollison to talk very briefly about the last exhibit. Yeah, so this is a gold work embroidery that I did when I was studying um, traditional needlework techniques at the Royal School of Needlework in 2013. So it's a dark blue um, silk dupion kind of bobbly silk background and then gold metallic threads which are sewn on like beads. Um, and it's a weeping eye sort of maybe Egyptian inspired. <laughs> eye of horrors. Mm -hmm. That's exactly right. And I loved having this at the end of the show because it's that, you know, you've been staring and staring and staring and now it's staring back at you. <laughs> and, I mean, and Kate, you've just recently brought that out and reframed it, I believe. Yeah, yeah, that's why I, I had the idea to include it in the exhibition. Yeah, and I would really encourage people to, you know, don't just don't just say goodbye to your work forever, you know, always go back to it. So I'm going to stop the screen share there. And I'm just going to end with a few thank yous. So thank you to Arts Council England, who've supported the exhibition, and to the National Lottery Community Fund, who support the art clubs, and indeed have signed up to support the art clubs for another three years. So we will soon have an engagement support worker to assist with all the things that make it easier to take part. Um, I've of course, like to thank the access support workers, Chris Burrow, our sign language interpreter, and Julia, our captioner. Thank you so much for that. I know that's made it life much easier for a number of us this evening. I'd like to thank Emily, my assistant, who's been pressing buttons. And of course, a huge thank you to the team, Kate Rollison, our youth development worker, Rene Wallen, our social media lead and of course massive massive thanks to Alison Marchant who runs the art club without whom this exhibition would not have taken place. I love the open exhibition I, I know I would say that wouldn't I but I just it's the only exhibition that I ever see that has so much joy and so much energy and I think it's because there's no gatekeeping and there's no kind um. of old there's this label for this person and this label for that person. It's just all there together. So it's going to be up. Well, I say it's up for Disability Pride Month, but really it will stay on our website. At some point it will end up in the archive section, but not for the rest of this year. I don't know what else is happening in the rest of the world for Disability Pride Month, but do keep an eye out for it. And we'll make sure that each year Disability Pride Month and the open exhibition just go from strength to strength but my biggest thanks really is to all of you for making the time to join us join together tonight it's been great to have an event that for the very first time has felt like our sort of in-person celebrations and not where the exhibition is part of a festival or part you know or the event that's celebrating the exhibition is part of something else it's just been really great to have an artist-centered event and we'll be doing lots more of them if you don't go to the art club already then have a look online you know and again if you don't go to the friday group think about it have a think about the tuesday group and in particular have a think about joining in with our kitchen carnival which runs for the rest of the summer if you missed the kitchen carnival yesterday and you'd like to be caught up 
I can give you a private access to the Zoom recording. Angus, by the way, I think you would love it. And Jemima. Yeah, well, I'd like to see that. Yeah, uh, yeah I know Jemima's very busy, but I think you would enjoy it, Jemima. And I think everybody would who wasn't already there. So I hope to see more of you next week. And for the rest of you, have a really good evening. Have a great weekend and a great Disability Pride Month. Thank and you very much. Thank Bye. you, Jude. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.